Um, so I hope everybody hears me well online as well as here. Uh, my talk today will be about Massive Urban Building Energy Simulation, uh, which stands for MIPS, which is the name of the project I've been working for the last few years. And to say it in another word, more known denomination, it's about Urban Building Energy Modeling, UBM. So first of all, some classical element and information. Why? So we work at the UBIM on UBIM. Well, on the building sector, we have still this one third ratio uh, on these two growing elements, which are the energy use and the emission worldwide. Um, so it, need, it means that we have room for impro improvement if we want to reach the target of, of um, limiting the climate change and the uh, emission worldwide. But it doesn't mean that we haven't done anything. There is lots of improvement that have been done. You see a discharge taken from EIA, uh, IEI 2019, uh, the energy intensity for different usage has been improved by quite a large amount. I mean, space heating minus 20% the last 10 years. Uh, you have only the space cooling that have increased, uh, but it, this is due to an increase of the demand of it. And on the lower graph from taking from 2020, uh, you can see that the increase of energy still raises, sorry, it still increases, as well as the emission, but at a lower pace at the floor area. This is thanks to building regulation, first of all, energy levels and all the modeling tools that have been widely and commonly used now worldwide on the building sector. But these were mostly oriented on the new buildings area. New buildings are really efficient ones. And if you want to lower down even more the emission or the energy use, you can put some local production on site or make the share of energy even more better within the buildings at the district scale. For BMS building management system, the next level will be DMS, district management system uh, for new areas. But the building's called the existing one. Um, the change of, of the existing one is still uh, fixed on the pace of the owner will. So if you want to steer, if you want to raise a little bit the pace of renovation action of the building stock, uh, you need to support or you need to enhance the will of owners to make this transition. And for this, it's generally political and policies at the city scale or states even scale. So, and you need some larger views on the existing building stock. What action shall we support that will be the best efficient for the building stock? And for this, we need to scale up the beam building energy model to the U-beam, urban building energy model. And this way we will be able to forecast what action will be the best at the, for the building stock. Uh, so what is UBIM? Uh, so different types of models for different usage. We all pretty know it has been split on top down or bottom up, top down. It's based on global uh, values, like the growth of economic, uh, in economy of a country based on the compare, sorry, to the building uh, sector energy usage or emission. Um, technical development, how heat pump development, for instance, has contributed to lower down the energy uh, demand at the global scale or climate issue as well, um, how the rate of average temperature has uh, changed or not the energy usage at the global scale. And then you try, you can split, starting from aggregate data, you can split it and analyze this further to um, go down at a lower scale. And bottom up can be split it into two elements, the data-driven statistical model or physics-based model. The first one, um, are resumed here by energy signature, for instance. Energy signature is a pretty li simple linear model that links the uh, power that you need at the building scale compared to the external temperature. Uh, machine learning, what we call black box models, or conditional demand analysis, which means that depending on the appliances that each building has, and depending on the, each consumption for each appliances, we can scale up and build a global scale building stock energy demand out of it. But top-down or data-driven bottom-up um, are always based on the past. I mean, what has been done uh, from the data from the past, and it's pretty difficult to forecast the future of it. It's pretty difficult to forecast what energy conservation measure will have as an action for the future demand. And for this, it's more physics-based model, what we call white box model. So it's based on dynamic thermal simulation. So we just resolve heat balance and pressure balance. And if we stick to the UBIM um, function, uh, defined as well by Skavgek in, in 2010, UBIM should be able to estimate the baseline energy demand for the existing building stock. It should be able to explore technical and economic effect of energy conservation measures 
at the global energy use and emission, and it shall also be able not to, or to compute, sorry, the indoor environment impact as well of your ECM. And if you try to stick to this, the choice is pretty limited. I mean, you need to use bottom-up physics-based model. So we started from here and said, we need to develop this platform uh, for MOOCs based on bottom-up physics-based models. Then the other question with UBIM is, what scale? If you look at the county scale, you have eight, merely 80, uh, 85,000 buildings in Stockholm County. If you look at the city scale, you can lower it down to 10,000. If you take a part of the city, you will have 5,000 buildings. If you look at the district scale for Hammarby, for instance, you have more, more or less 300 buildings. And then the district, local small district scale, it's still a beam and it's 40 buildings. So how can I address all these different scales? Um, I like this picture taken from Anganal um, review on UBIM. Um, you have, um, sorry, I'm gonna take my ladder point. Uh, so you have an urban area and the address, how to address this different scale is by doing archetypes. Archetypes paradigm is about um, identifying the representative element of the cluster of the population. So you need to split uh, your urban area into um, different uh, archetypes, so based on the geometry or model inputs. And I would say that different, depending on the scale, your choices, uh, I mean, on 85,000 building, you have no choice but to identify what would be the best representative in the geometry side, uh, geometry for office, what would be the best for residential and retails. You can split those into several others, but you will never uh, build 85,000 models. Okay? And down you go on the scale, the more precise you can be both on the geometry or on the model input as well. So it's equivalent to market segmentation, making archetypes. I have my building stock and I have to split it into different clusters. Uh, and I have to identify the representative element of this cluster and I will model this one. How do I take into account the uh, uncertainty within my cluster? It's also a full story of research as well. Uh, but this clustering is really part of, um, of the process of UBIM and making a study with UBIM. And um, the criteria of making your clustering, I mean, shall I split on your construction, or energy class, flow area, occupancy type, energy carrier, ventilation type, et cetera. You have plenty of ways of splitting out your entire building flow. And generally it depends on your use case and as well on your computational capacity. Because of course the smallest cluster possible will be the best. But you will have, maybe you, you will have your 85,000 clusters, which is useless then. So it's always a balance, like every domain, I would say. It's a balance and compromise between your capacities, the target, the precision you want. Uh, and this is the first part of, of making this clustering. Now, what are the inputs for EBIM? You have two, there are two, ty two types of inputs. Sorry, I have a left arrow. Uh, for geometry uh, side, I like these pictures of Bilgeki. So it's the representation of the level of details, how uh, uh, up to which kind of details we're able to model our building. And if you have a very large cluster, you will never model um, this LOD 3.3, for instance. And I would say that UBIM would stand between LOD 1.1 up to LOD 2.1, even because, but introducing even pitch truth. On, on, on 5,000 model, it's pretty complex as well. So um, LOD 1.1 to LOD 1.3 would, would be the best, uh, would be the most common, I would say, and even up to this level, okay, but I think UVM will never go up to this kind of level of detail here. And then for the input. So you have the, uh, you have the static element. I have a missing, yeah, it's coming here after, sorry. So I will put this, Right away, this way you have this small thing that I added just this morning, but I forget with the animation. I'm sorry. Uh, you have the for model inputs, you have the static elements and the dynamic element. The static elements, of course, for each model, you need to define what are your materials, in inertia and insulation, roof and walls are both super important to be defined. Uh, if you have external or internal insulation, the inertia will have a totally different effect on your uh, dynamics of the building and thus on your needs. So you need to consider this as well. Um, and a strange point or funny point with the beam is the window wall ratio. At the beam scale, 
uh, you would never thought that this is an unknown parameter, even the ratio, because you know, at the beam scale, you know your building. So you know the envelope and its architectural external facade at least. But at the beam scale, you don't even know how much window all the buildings have. So it's part of the uncertainty. So you have these elements, which are pretty, still could be considered as coarse, but had, has, that has great influence in the building their level, but you don't know at the U-beam scale uh, with what would be the window, where it was window to wall ratio for each. And then you have the dynamic elements, which are uh, um, uh, tremendously important uh, to compute your global energy needs, but that has also dynamic effect. Uh, if you have temperature set point adjustment, scheduling or a night day or scheduled uh, temperature set point, large variation of occupancy rate. I mean, on the residential scale, sorry, um, it doesn't play so much, but if you have hostel, restaurant, retails, you need to consider this large variation or offices, you need to consider this large variation of occupancy rate. And especially if it's linked to the demand controlled ventilation, if ventilation is uh, linked to the occupancy, it can be, um, uh, it can vary it by really strong amount and ventilation in the building energy balance is a heat sink. I mean, you would like to lower down as much as possible the ventilation to preserve energy, but you have people inside and you need to renew the fresh air from it, uh, of the building. And then you have all the internal appliances uh, and lighting, so the internal gains. I would say, so here you have a, sorry, a small um, uh, chemi or drawing of a, a thermal zone, what we'd say, or a floor or a zone. Uh, for which you need to define the internal mass equivalent. All the furnitures plays quite an important effect on the buffering as well on the behavior of the temperature or humidity. Or So you need to consider this internal mass, occupancy, appliances, and the HVAC system and the envelope leakage. This is the element that are defined in the zone level. And here you have a graph of what we consider, we have considered for the occupancy appliances and lighting at the, for residential type of occupancy, because for this, you don't have that much of variation of occupancy and you can aggregate, I would say, all the released in, inside heat by a kind of sigmoid curve that you can play on the slope of the sigmoid to represent, to represent a kind of a seasonal effect of it. It would mean that the straight line, you will release the same amount of watts year round. If you want to release it, to consider a bit of more release heat on the winter time, well, you just have to increase the slope a little bit and you will have this sigmoid here. Okay, so this is, and we, we played gamma here is a parameter of the, the platform we've been using. Uh, what value for each input now at the urban scale? Uh, well, you have some um, attempt that have been done. Uh, Tabula project, which is a uh, well-known um, European project from 2009 to 2012, that tried to make this clustering approach of the buildings. Okay, you have dueling, you have office, it has been built this year. U values of windows should be probably, probably between this and that values. Uh, roof, construction, and so on. So it's it's it was a large uh, a project. It's 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 been used by most of the UBIM UBIM tools at the European level, uh, but of course it does not cover everything. But it's uh, it's definitely to consider for input for any UBIMs. Uh, in Sweden, then you have this uh, book as well. It's more based on the architecture point of view, but it's still a retrace for the last century the building evolution in Sweden. So it's also lots of good information to consider for um, feeding your clustering process. Um, you have, of course, and it, this is uh, uh, true for every country uh, that uh, well, future country and most of the countries um, that have energy performance certificates. These are being mandatory now in most of the countries as well. And uh, these are, are being more and more um, feeded with important information as well. Um, uh, so it's a database that is growing and growing and it, that will grow the ongoing year as well. Um, so in Sweden, for instance, it also gives you the numbers of floors, numbers of stairwell, the heating system, the occupancy type and percentage of occupancy, occupancy type if you have difference. And it's renew every 10 years. So it's a good information, even though you don't know between uh, two, 10 years if the building has changed. But it's still a, a good information from it. And Boverket building regulation as well, depending on when the building has been built, it had to 
to follow the regulation at the time. So it's, it's still important to consider. And in Sweden as well, we had this uh, work done on from Svebi, which, which kind of aggregate as well all this and give you a nice uh, um, information to feed your EB. But even though those projects give you range of expectation within your cluster, and then you have your diversity of your cluster as well to consider in your simulation. So uh, UBIM is strongly attached, I would say, to probabilistic approach. So you need to guess, you need to play dice, and in order to be confident with your dice and with your game, you need to play several times. So probabilistic approach is about uh, giving each input uh, a range of expectation and a distribution law. A distribution that could have been uh, defined from your uh, database. Okay, from history, we know that it follows gamma uh, distribution or uniform or normal or whatever. So, and then you have your model, you have hopefully some known inputs that you know it's this value and so what we call deterministic input. And then you compute and you are happy because you have um, a distribution of, out of output. It can be emission, it can be energy needs, it can be whatever the model is able to give you. Uh, thanks to this white box physical based model. Uh, but then you still raise a question, I mean, is how ac accurate is my computed distribution and how can I get thinner? I mean, if you give me this amount of energy needs plus minus 100%, is it worse of interest? Maybe not. So how can I reduce it as well? And uh, if I miss, my distribution misses the real, real value, then I'm, 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 I'm not getting uh, further to my former point. Uh, how to sample as well along this parameter? I mean, am I able to have dyes that are not linked? Maybe not. And if, how do I consider the correlation between these? This is a knife graph taken from a master thesis uh, from Umeo University. So it shows you one parameter or Gaussian distribution. The two plots for non-correlated parameters, these are parameters uh, that are correlated in 2D, but if you have 3D, you become, become to have a kind of balloon that expresses the correlation between those. But what do you do if you have more than three parameters? You cannot even see it because here you have a 9D uh, and these were the energy needs, the last column. You can see that some parameters are, are linked for sure. Some might not. So how can I sample all these parameters to do my probabilistic simulation? Well, the question is how to generate sample from non-necessary normal parameter that have non-necessary re linear relationship. I mean, the covariance spec in the Scholecki decomposition doesn't work anymore if you don't have all this. So, but we can do this thanks to copulas. Copulas is a function which joins or couples a multivariate distribution function to its one dimensional marginal distribution. Believe me, I'm not able to demonstrate faster than myself, but believe me uh, for sure, uh, it expressed that the multivariate distribution can be expressed by the capula, which is a function of the marginal cumulative distribution functions. And X is all your parameters, and F1 to N is the cumulative distribution function of each. It has been widely used in finance and risk assessment since the 90s, uh, in hydrology since 2000, in ecology since 2010. I found an application for UBIM by a recent PhD from Belgium, from Ina de Jager. And I only found four paper in Scopus uh, leaking copula and building energy. And one was from Ina de Jager. So it's a, a really a nice uh, tool that enables you to sample your correlated parameters. Uh, workflow from UBIM would be scale of analysis, that define my archetype definition, geometry inputs. I produce my sample now, thanks to Copula, and I'm running my simulation. But I still don't know if I'm accurate on my real value. So if I have a way to make model calibration, it would be super awesome. Then I can really use with a lot of trust my model that, I've, that I, has been calibrated. So enhancing the trust of you being my undertaking calibration, so it's about finding the joint distribution of your unknown inputs that makes UBIM tool reliable. And then you will be able to use it to change windows or increase insulation or put a hit pump or whatever. You will have way more trust in the result of your model if you calibrate it. Uh, I'm being super late, I'm sorry, but... Uh, so first of all, we have developed this uh, calibration process using Copula. So first of all, I'm playing dice 
I'm running 200 runs of dynamic energy simulation with Latini parking sampling over my nine dies. Uh, I'm computing the one that matches by 20%, 10%, uh, or hopefully less, but not here uh, for the first iteration. So I get my, from my prior, which were early form, I get a really tiny posteriors uh, that are fitted by these points. Here you have the space heating needs, which is my output of my model. And here is one of the input parameters. So I found the one that matched my differences, uh, my observation by 20 and 10%, and I highlight which values of this parameter, for instance, but you have other behind, uh, that are responsible of this, these values. And I'm building a weighted sample thanks to my 10%, 20%, and I don't give the same weight uh, if I get closer to my real value. And then I'm able to build a copula based sample for correlated, but I'm not really sure about it. So I still bring newcomers. So I have two sets of dyes, one pipe dyes that are linked and one free dyes that are not linked. And I'm playing again. And you can already see that here, the one that is colored is the pipe dyes the correlated ones. You can already see that the wetness of the results are completely, completely different to this one, even though the range of the parameter are strictly the same. So the wetness of your result, wetness of your result is completely linked to the correlation that you gave to your first uh, uh, parameters. And you do this again. And then here you find that, oh, I had now black dots. Black dots represent that error less than 5%. And see, it's funny because it's given by my newcomers, mostly. So it's important to still consider newcomer, newcomers in this iteration process. And you have this queuing process. So I'm using my former posterior as a prior for my next sampling process and so on and so on. And here I'm, I'm feeding, uh, I can see that I'm feeding my, my joint distribution. And at the last stage, I'm even increasing the amount of correlated sample. And I estimate that, okay, I have my calibrated joint distribution because I estimated here, in this case, we estimated a, a minimum of 100 of good combination. I'm confident. I have 100 of combination that explain my model pretty well. I can use those now. And um, so you have this for nine parameter. This is another case. And of course, we have done this for a use case. Uh, the use case has been done with MRB with 35 buildings that still represent more than a thousand of apartment, 130,000 uh, square meter of residential type of occupancy, almost 10,000 meters of uh, non-occupancy type. Uh, we had, thanks to Exergy, the data, hourly data of space heating and domestic hot water. Uh, so we amuse ourselves to say, hey, is it worth having yearly calibrated model, monthly or weekly ones? We didn't go below weekly because domestic hot water had to be removed out of it. Domestic hot water is related to you, to you, to your occupancy level. And tuning the water taps to make my model match would make all other parameters completely irrelevant. So because domestic hot water, even if it, on a really efficient building, it represents half, barely half of your energy consumption. And on poor building, it was one fourth, for instance. So it's still way bigger than tuning your insulation. So we had to remove it. Uh, it's explained on the paper that is attached to this presentation. Uh, and so the average uh, of the process of removing the domestic red, uh, uh, hot water um, uh, made us choose the highest resolution being the weekly one. Uh, and then we tested as well two cases because we use one side calibrated model, I'm happy, but it's not the end of the process. I need to use the EBM to do something. And we um, computed, we forecasted energy savings from an ECM and then raised the question, my ECM, my parameter that I want to improve, did I knew it before or not? Because even though you want to change the window, you still have uncertainties within your first initial model. So we ask ourselves, does that make a difference if I, I change, I improve the parameters that I formerly calibrated. Uh, sorry, it's important. Still the process. So we repeated the entire process six times. So we had 130,000 simulation done on this marvelous laptop. It took almost 10 days of computation. Uh, I was in uh, Turin on vacation to grab the Northern Lights while he was working for me. Uh, but on the average, it's one hour per building. A building is not one dueling. A building is 100 or 60 dualings because it's uh, collective residential buildings. Uh, 
Um, so results is on the yearly basis, we had 32 over 35 buildings that matched the, the entire process, 30 over 35 for monthly and 27 for the weekly one. I mean, we know that the more you need to be precise at a dynamically scale, the more input you need. So we were not shocked at all about this, this result. Still 27 buildings, all the one that matched the weekly match of course the monthly and the yearly one as well. Uh, it still represents a little bit less than 1,000 uh, apartments, 1, uh, 100,000 square meter, and a little bit of 8,000 square meter of non-residential occupancy type. We validated, of course, our model. Uh, we had data for several buildings for two other years. So we took the joint calibrated distribution, like gold. We changed the weather condition for these two years. And we launched uh, um, all the runs from the calibrated distribution. And you can see that this um, colored area is the uh, range of errors that are accepted for a yearly, monthly, and weekly uh, calibration. You can already see that, hey, this doesn't work so much for some building. Indeed, for this building, we had uh, we analyzed the data. And then we saw that the if you compute a quite coarse energy model out of it, uh, energy signature, sorry, out of it, the slope changed. So it might be not talkative to people who don't know energy signature model, but believe me, if the change slope, it means that either the building has changed or your data are screwed. Uh, my calibrated, so the calibrated model cannot catch a building that has changed, of course. So we were still happy about this calibration process. And of course, I mean, uh, we don't want to, uh, to say that it's the best solution ever because it needs to be, we're academics, you know, it needs to be validated on other cases, on other data, on other climate, etc. Uh, the error result on the calibration process, building versus district scale. On the building scale, you can see that, wow, all my cases, case one, two, didn't, are, are not really different between those two. So. Uh, but this is the uh, mean BA's error used for yearly because I have one single values and I use the coefficient variation of the root mean square for weekly and monthly. So you can see that this one is fixed to 15 maximum. This one is bounded between minus, minus five and plus five because it's the threshold I've used to make calibration. So it's pretty obvious. What is more interesting is that if I'm computing a yearly value out of weekly and monthly base calibrated, I have a way wider error and an underestimation. This is due to the function I used for making the calibration because um, CV uh, RMSC uh, doesn't protect you from overestimation or underestimation. I mean, if you have curves that are a bit over, you can still pass the threshold of the CV RMSC, uh, but you can, can and sometimes don't pass the NMB uh, error. And this tiny mistakes, even though you said, well, it's okay on the average, I have 3% of mistakes. If I building a virtual district out of all this distribution of buildings, so I'm sampling hundreds of districts based on my hundreds of uh, building each. Um, the, uh, this is the total measure for 2012. So the year we used to make calibration, this is the yearly virtual uh, district distributions. It's pretty okay with the, with the measurements, but if I'm using weekly and monthly, I mean, this uh, uh, pretty large, uh, pretty large, even though it's 5%, but it still represents 500 of megawatt hour at the district scale. Underestimation comes from this tiny lower estimation on the building scale. So you have some tiny effect on the building scale that can increase on a district scale. So it's also worth to consider this and to keep this in mind. Uh, now my ECMs. So we've changed windows. Okay, pretty uh, super uh, new renovation action. And uh, this is the uh, impact of the ECM. So it's plus, but it, it lowered down the demand, uh, hopefully by 10% in average for case one and by 13 to 14% for case two. You have lots of outliers, why? Because this is, our, this is for my 27 buildings. So I, all building does not react the same to a renovation action, so some, react pretty uh, intensively and some uh, pretty low. So this is a cumulative uh, distribution for each buildings. And then on the district scale, if I aggregated all this, the percentage level is uh, more or less the same, uh, but you have no more overlaps between. And, um, and uh, here, what is more interesting, the case, 
the difference between the case. And remember case one is I'm just queuing a parameter that I didn't knew before. So it's a parameter that was embedded in my joint distribution. It has its own marginal and the copula has its dependency structures that takes into this, this parameter into account. And then I just changed the marginal of this one. So it, was, it can be quite rude to the copula, but I've changed it to, 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 to make it. So I changed the dependency structure as well. Compared to case two, for which I had my marginal distribution and I had a deterministic parameter that I changed. So it looks like the effect of this uh, ECMs is still lower down or buffered or change a bit uh, by the compensation effect that is skewed uh, from the calibration process. I mean, we shall be honest, calibration is about finding compensation effect. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't guarantee that the value that is found at calibration is the true value. It's the value that match the other one, including some compensation effect. I mean, okay. Um, so this was on the technical part, and now for uh, more of a resume on MOOBs. MOOBs platform is available and is online and is an open source. Uh, it has been integrated and funded in MOOBs project, funded by E2B2 research program. You have the number of the project here, compatible with 2D, 3D polygons. Uh, inputs can be given deterministically or probabilistically uh, by best distribution types as well. Shadowing file um, is also available. You have a script that computes for you the shadowing element from the, your surroundings. And it has been made for automatic modeling and simulation using Energy Plus at the core thermal engine and Python as the global manager. And it has also been made for making enable the FMU's construction from core simulation. We talked about uh, earlier about DMS, district management system, or how could demand response strategy at the district scale could even reduce the energy demand. Well, you need for that because core simulation. Core simulation about this building communicated with my neighbors. And for this, you need to exchange information at each time step. This is what we call core simulation. And uh, the platform enables for you to build automatic FMU's uh, you have two examples on the Git that use FMPy as uh, the environment for that. Uh, it's compatible with the National French Database, quite recently released. Uh, of course, with other city, here you have the Boston city in US, uh, a part of it. So, uh, and of course, it's compatible with Odin, the work from my colleague Alexi Positioni that I thank uh, here today for hosting me for these two years and more or less hiring me as well. Uh, he has done this super nice tool, Odin. So you can see um, entirely Sweden, I would say. But it will be available soon directly from the web page. So you will be able to select some building from Stockholm and launch my platform, the MIPS platform, next to it. Uh, thank you.